Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is the CEO of Minds.com, Bill Ottman. How are you doing? Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Now, those of you who were watching last year, which is probably a, a good number of you, will remember that. Uh, Last year, I posted a video called uh, something like Minds.com is garbage or something like that. And uh, <laughs> that came after a little disagreement about uh, how they were dealing with some material. But one thing very interesting that happened was once I posted that, um, I started getting messages from people saying, uh, hey, the CEO, Bill, Bill Ottman, is, is saying you, you should contact him about this and, and discuss this which I thought was very weird because as all of you know, you can't get in touch with anyone at YouTube for anything, let alone the CEO. You're not gonna get in touch with anyone at Twitter. You're not gonna get in touch with anyone at Facebook. And if you do manage to get in touch with anyone on those platforms, you get uh, some really, really weird, clueless people who have no respect whatsoever for uh, free speech or anything like that. And so uh, very disheartening on the main social media platforms. And so it was weird. It was weird that um, someone who actually runs a platform was uh, saying that I should contact him. And then more recently, he uh, he sent me an email and said, hey, you want to talk about what happened last year? And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we discuss it uh, live? So we're going to be talking about what happened um last year and we'll all get a uh, an idea of what the what the policies on mines are and so on we'll do that in uh in a couple of minutes i just wanted to get some background from um from bill ottman so if you could introduce yourself and tell us a, a little bit about your platform before we get into any of the any of the specifics hey yeah man thanks for having me on so mines is a open source social network dedicated to internet freedom um we have a First Amendment-based content policy. We are as transparent as possible. Anyone can inspect our code, make sure there's no shady al algorithms or surveillance. Anyone, anyone could actually take our whole code base and make their own platform with our code. And we encourage that, actually. Uh, additionally, we're really interested in decentralizing our infrastructure. Uh, we leverage the blockchain in a handful of ways. Now, uh, 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 quick, I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to interrupt, uh, but uh, suppose that some of us are completely technologically illiterate on most of this stuff, and so that when yeah. you say things like open chain or block such and such, that we, we don't actually know what you're talking about. There. Block source, yeah. open chain, yeah. Okay, so imagine the big tech companies are all housed on central servers that are like in a warehouse that only they control. Okay. So decentralized infrastructures, which, you know, we don't claim to be fully decentralized, but these are powered by computers all over the world that cannot be taken down. So mm. if you compare like Bitcoin, for instance, or Ethereum or, you know, another kind of cryptocurrency to a fiat money system, you know, it's, like, you know, the dollar and other central currencies are controlled by a much smaller group of people and they can influence, you know, they can inflate, they can make these determinations on a whim. In Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's it's decentralized. It's it's not controlled by a small group of people. So in the same way, if your content is on Facebook or Google or or Twitter, you know, it's much more subject to getting taken down. Um if it's if it's on central infrastructure as opposed to decentral infrastructure so you know there's there's good and bad things about that you know in certain circumstances you want your content to be totally uncensorable you know you may want to unleash it into the abyss of of you know torrents and blockchains and all this stuff where it can't get deleted or you may want to publish it to a computer where you can delete it and you want to have that control over it. So we believe you should have both options. You should, you should be able to control it as a user. And yeah, I mean, you know, relating to what happened with, I think one of your posts got tagged as NSFW. So because we're a first amendment focused company in terms of our content policy, we allowed the full spectrum. So, you know, you'll definitely see some more edgy stuff. 
And, you know, unfortunately, there exists sort of a area in the middle where, you know, people disagree over whether that counts as NSFW or not. We definitely don't censor NSFW content. I mean, Facebook and Twitter, you know, they, they just don't even allow you to have it. We want all of that content to be able to exist. So, you know, there's certain areas where, you know, say there's a content, a piece of content where, you know, it's very violent. Um, then, you know, some people may think that that should have a blur on it. Others don't. We actually built a jury system so that if people disagree with our decision, it can get appealed. And our appeal system doesn't go to us. Our appeal system goes to the community. And we intentionally built that to protect against ourselves because, you know, we're a company and we understand that, you know, there's potential for mistakes to be made or for bias to, to leak in. And so we wanted our appeal system to be in the hands of the community. I believe that that's what happened with your content. I think that one of your posts got reported and then it got marked. It just got blurred, you know, and, and I think you got a strike, but you have to understand you, you cannot get banned for having NSFW content on mines. So even though you got a strike and I understand that that like seemed scary, you weren't even close to getting banned. That wasn't in the realm of possibilities. It was just a, a, putting a blur on your channel, on, on, your, on that piece of content. So I, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but you appealed it and it got reversed. Is that true? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it's got a quick question from uh, Black Angel here who says, uh, what is NSD, uh, NSFW? Uh, that's not safe for work. Um, Black Angel. So the, the idea here is if you have a platform like uh, like Mines or BitChute, which isn't going to be as quick to block content, then what happens if people are on the platform at work and they're not they don't block certain kinds of content that might not be safe if your your boss walks by? So content that might not be exactly what it sounds like not safe for work if you're if someone walks by is that is that right because i didn't know what it was either when when i yeah when I sorry i should have said that from the beginning but i mean you know i i post nsfw content once in a while um i think that you know say you're posting uh war footage or a uh risque photo or uh a you know a piece of art from 300 years ago that may have a, you know, a little thing right, you know, on your body part that's not allowed to be on, on the big network. So, you know, NSFW isn't necessarily a positive or negative thing. I, th I think that we can agree that certain content is, you know, probably could have a blur over it. And if you want to see that, you can opt in to see that. We have a setting so that you don't have to see the blurs and you, I'm actually opted into that setting so that I don't see blurs, I, I see all the content. But we just think that if somebody signs up, you don't want to just be throwing that in their face. You know, mm -hmm. you kind of want to give a normal person the control over that setting. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I, I want to, uh, yeah, I want, I want to share my thoughts on this because I'm not crazy about that system and yet I'm not sure what the system should be. In other words, we, we, we have, we do have this situation where we look at Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and say, you know, you guys are, are losing your minds with, with all the stuff that you're banning. Uh, you're calling everything hate speech, even if it doesn't come within a thousand miles of anything, any rational human being would consider hate speech the blocking, they're blocking content. And yet, depending on where you draw the line, if you say, okay, we're, I mean, if someone said, we're not going to block anything, then you're going to end up with like, you know, you need to take a bath after going to the site because you're going to be, you're going to run into so much horrible content. And so how do you, you know, how do you, how do you respect free freedom of speech while not seeing all kinds of horrible content that you, you just don't want to interact with. So that's kind of the issue. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to navigate that, but uh, I'll share my thought. I'll, I'll basically share my thought process last year. So, uh, so last year I got the thing, uh, you know, I got the notification saying that uh, I was getting a strike for my content being not safe for work, but I, I hadn't labeled it as, as not safe for work and that uh, I could appeal and it would go to, and I, 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 I had been, 
on a couple of those jury decisions where I would get a notification saying, hey, look at this content. Do you think that this should uh, have, you know, this label on it or something like that? So, uh, so, so anyway, I, 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 I'm familiar with how the, how the system works, that people get a notification asking them, hey, could you, could you take a look at this real quick? Uh, my video was just, it was just uh, people who had, had sent me messages saying, I believe, I believe, I haven't, I haven't gone back and looked at that, but uh, basically people had sent me notifications saying that they were uh, becoming Christians in various parts of, of the Muslim world and so on, or, or Muslims who had become Christians. And I think that, I think that's what the video was. I, I posted that. And so my, my thought, my thoughts were, I understand, how, I understand completely having a not safe for work category. Uh, for things like, you know, if there's nudity or something, you know, something else, uh, completely understand that. My, my thinking was, should this, should this be at all in the ballpark of something that should be labeled not safe for work? And then I, I didn't put this in a video, but it was about, I don't know, a, a week later when my, the picture on my homepage got flagged as uh, not safe for work. And I, I had to appeal that as well. But my, it's just a painting of Socrates. Um, and so I was, I was basically thinking that I'd be dealing with a similar situation on YouTube, which is namely that all my content gets flagged. So in other words, there are bad actors involved. There are people who aren't going, whoa, this content is shocking. I need to flag this. It's David Wood posted something. Let's go flag it. And so everything I post on YouTube gets flagged. And the problem is it goes to, uh, you know, some human reviewer. And a lot of the human reviewers are just, yep, I don't like that. And so it's not whether it follows the rules or not. It's just, uh, let me go ahead and click on this. So basically, all of my stuff will get flagged. Everything I post will get flagged. And so it looked, here's what it looked, here's what it looked like. It looked like, well, everything I post is going to get flagged. So everything that I post is going to have to go and get me uh, a temporary strike for not safe for work. I would appeal it. I would win all of those appeals, but it seemed like now there's this extra step where everything, everything that I post is going to get me a strike. And then I'm going to have to go to this sort of online uh, jury system review and then get my stuff uh, put back up as, as safe for work. Cause I mean, as far as I can tell, all, all my stuff is safe, safe for work work there's there's nothing too risque in, in anything i post so anyway those were my thoughts and and so the, yeah there was that i had one more concern but but what are your thoughts on that because again i look at this and i say i i don't like having this extra step where i post it and then it goes through you know this long process of strike and appeal and then it's then it's okay i don't like that but i'm not exactly sure what the process what the process would be what would be better i completely understand where you're coming from so let me first say that in terms of monetization we actually allow nsfw to be monetized so there's actually not even a such thing as demonetization on mines um and in terms of there is an nsfw category uh, about race and religion. And we've had a lot of internal debates about, you know, if that's too broad or like what exactly that should be. But unfortunately, like legitimate criticism of religion, which it appears to, I haven't w watched all of your content or anything, but it appears to me that you're like a, a legitimate, you know, critic of of certain religions and that you know that's obviously important yeah. unfortunately that probably got lumped in with you know some of the more harsh um you know slur type stuff about religion and i don't know what happened i wasn't involved in the report or I, I actually even think that the person who on our end may have allowed that to be marked NSFW isn't even with the company anymore. But regardless, you know, those kinds of things are sort of inevitable. And we just were, we really thought deeply about how we can prevent uh, ourselves from becoming biased. And, and I understand you don't want to go through a step each each time. And I think that there should be a process for a channel like yours to not have to deal with that. 
because if it's the same kind of thing happening over and over again, that seems like a little bit unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the it was the initial rollout of the system, and it seemed like you know a mistake was made. It seems like the system worked in a way, but I also understand the inconvenience. But I also want you to understand that it's different from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter because we're not saying you're going to get banned. Mm-hmm. You know, we're saying that your channel could eventually get into this category, mm-hmm. which isn't even necessarily a positive or negative category. It's just a category, and it's not necessarily a punishment either. It's just a way for us to categorize content but i also i get it why you're frustrated so but the reason we reached out right after is because we recognized that it was sort of a problem and we wanted to figure out how to you know talk to you and under you know figure out is there a way we can improve the system but you know we thought deeply about it and blurs and opt-in layers for more controversial stuff. I mean, I support controversial, controversial content. The, you need controversial content on the internet. That's what free speech is for. You don't need free speech unless it's for controversial content. So the question is your, that you're asking is correct. What is the alternative solution if you're not going to create opt-in blurs and screen flows? And I've looked really deeply about it. I'm, we're totally open to other ideas, but um, you know, I'm curious your your thoughts on no, uh, other no, possibilities. I, I agree. I agree on the uh, I agree on the not safe for work um, feature. It's more yeah. It's it's more along the lines of um, of how stuff gets labeled and, and what the process is. So yeah, it, it does make sense. I, I yeah. I just I can't think of. It seems like, guys. In case you're in case you're not in, cl- in case you're new to this and you've never seen that before, here here's the idea: if if YouTube or Facebook or something like that says uh, we don't like your content, they block it. They give you a strike. If that happens a couple times, they'll just they'll just kick you off the platform or something like that. And it's totally completely bogus and absurd uh, the things that they say that they're they're blocking you for. I don't block. I don't I don't violate any rules on. Uh, on YouTube, and yet I get blocked regular. I get my content blocked pretty pretty regularly over basically the human reviewer who just doesn't like my stuff. Right, it, it, the stuff goes back to a human reviewer, and a lot of these guys get their jobs straight coming straight out of their safe spaces on college campuses. And anything they don't, they've been trained. Anything they don't like is hate speech, and so they just say, "Up, oh, that is hate speech," even though it's not again, it's not any rational person's definition of hate speech. So, but here's here's the idea on. On a platform like Minds, instead of uh, mine saying this content uh, has to be banned, it's more like uh, this content is is just gonna it's gonna be blurred because it might not be safe for work. And uh, again, if you're at work and you're you know your coworkers around and you're you're you know flipping through uh, the site on your lunch break, you don't want certain things popping up on your screen. And so they would just blur it, and then you could click on if if you say that it's okay. So that seems like a good uh, a good system. It's more my, yeah, my concern was more along the lines of what do you do when you're you're a, you're a target by trolls and, you know, professional group of harassers who just constantly go around uh blocking um blocking content. You, you did have a you did have a a question a question here which would be uh a good start to sort of leading into some more of this. Uh Bart Connolly says, "What opinions does he says, what opinions does Bill Ottman consider so dangerous it has to be banned? So here I don't think he's talking about not safe for work, but what sort of th- like if someone were you, you, you were you were drawing the distinction between, you know, legitimate criticism of religion versus something else. So, guys, you should all be familiar with that. Uh, we we talk about various religious issues, atheism, Christianity, Islam. We have Muslims and Christians and atheists and Hindus in the chat. I have atheists and uh hindu moderators on on my channel so we all you know we all have these discussions but you also know there are people who come in there and say nuke mecca kill these people kill this group and so on right so that's kind of well that's a true threat of violence so so we're taking the first amendment approach um you know there are a couple of exceptions like if someone's like spamming you know maliciously spamming 
the network, you know, that that's that's sort of a, a different type of malicious activity that's not necessarily covered in the First Amendment. But I mean, t- true threats of violence are not OK. But, you know, otherwise it's OK. And it, it's not about like my opinion. This is this is why we're basing our policy in the First Amendment, because to be honest, the overhead of moderation on Twitter and Facebook is just insane. I don't know if you saw the uh, the Veritas leaks yesterday, I think it was, but it was pretty much the the moderators sitting there saying, you know, every time they see a certain opinion, they, they just ban it um, because they, they feel like they're doing a, a justice by that. And I can tell you that, you know, we have moderators and, you know, they, they may have made a mistake, but we're, we try to balance that out by like directly reaching out to you after it happened to try to work with you and figure out if there's a way that we can solve it. Because if, you know, the mistakes are, are going to happen, it's almost unavoidable. And we feel like we can compensate for that by being the most accessible network in terms of fixing issues. Like, you know, mm-hmm. there's humans over here. We want we mm-hmm. want to fix the problems. We're not just gonna send a bot response. And we are confident that, you know, as a community, we can work through the the edge cases or the mistakes. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and again, that is good. And and so I guess I guess the takeaway for me would be um, uh, understand that there are humans involved and that they're you know if people are dealing with false flags and stuff that that mistakes are going to be made in in any system even if it's functioning very very uh well and therefore you know the problem is i really love hyperbole right so if, uh, if someone if someone if someone does something i'm like this person is is, is you know i know so, it felt like you yeah. were going a little bit overboard i get why you're pissed yeah. and i think you deserve to be pissed because you're like oh i'm on this free speech network and then you're like okay same old shit um i don't know hopefully i didn't just get you demonetized we're uh, uh, we, we deal with worse stuff here so <laughs> okay so I get it, but I also felt like, yeah, you were sort of intentionally sensationalizing it yeah. to a certain degree because you were upset when we're clearly not them and we do mm-hmm. a million things that are the opposite of of them. So, you know, it's OK. I, I think you should be pissed and, and we need to be able to take the feedback and understand how we can prevent the edge cases. So so we've. We've considered moving the jury to the first degree of moderation so that we actually don't even have admins like on our team making these decisions and that it's sort of all run by the community. So even the first reports are not just the appeals, but the first reports are going to a community jury. There's a lot of reports, so it's not totally clear to me that we will be beta testing that process to back away from even the initial decision. And if you look at the the stats on the jury so far, it's pretty interesting. Let me uh, let me pull it up for some analytics. Um, so if you go to minds.com slash content dash policy and you go to the bottom, you can see that in the last 30 days, there were 7,794 actions taken by mines, 30 appeals, and 10 actions overturned. So of 7,800 actions total, there were 30 people who said, you know, I I want to appeal, and so 10 mistakes. So out of 7,800 actions, 10 mistakes. It's not bad. It's it, it, it's not bad, and I think that we want to continually up, improve that. But the fact that they were able to be overturned, to me, is success. And so even if there are mistakes, the fact that they're getting fixed, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, I don't know of another network that is achieving that type of objectivity to their own process. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me give you I, – I do have a concern about the uh... – the jury system on on the one hand it seems good to have something outside of some 
you know, little small centralized group like the, you know, one of these platforms, trust and safety teams who just they get to decide whatever they want and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And so there is there is something cool about being able to step outside of them and say, well, you know, what do what do actual users think? But um, what if you're someone like me who I don't particularly trust people? <laughs> in, in other words, in other words, I don't necessarily trust the people that this is going out to, right? So if you send it out to seven reviewers and you ask seven reviewers, um, hey, is, do you agree with this decision? How does that work anyway? Is it seven or is so it- So the, 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 the mandate is not like, do you agree? Mm -hmm. The mandate is to enforce the First Amendment based policy. Mm -hmm. Now, could people potentially get selected for a jury and be like, oh, I'm gonna go on a moral crusade and mm -hmm. do what I wanna do, not That's what my the, concern. The, it's a legitimate concern, but at the end of the day, it's like a more, per, we're trying to create a more perfect mm -hmm. system. And there, because there is not a perfect system. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you're dealing with the internet, which is insane, you know, you're dealing with just, I can't even list it all. It's, it, it, it is insane. The, the spectrum of content that is going on is just, you know, it's wild. And the, the, there's also, you know, it, it's, it's a smaller percentage of wild content, but it's there. And so we're just trying to create a more perfect system. Honestly, our code is open where we have developers around the world who are contributing to it. We're totally open for improvements to it. If we can detect people who are consistently voting in the jury in a way that is against our system, we're working on detecting that. Mm -hmm. So if, if they're, cons you know, if, if someone is consistently in the minority and they're wrong, in terms of enforcing the First Amendment based policy, we're working on trying to detect that so that they would no longer be able to participate in the jury. And we're also looking at expanding the jury beyond 12 people so that, you know, it, it seems like with higher numbers, there's probably less chance for error. But, you know, we're open to proposals. And, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people like to you know, I'm not saying this in an overly critical way, but people love to complain and not build software. Mm -hmm. So building software is the hard part and designing products is the hard part. So it's easy to say, oh, you know, this sucks. This is this is more of the same, but it's like, okay, what what is your actual suggestion? Like, here's the code. This is how the juries are working. This is the size. This is the prompt, you know, you can go look at the UX of it. You can make criticisms, send us the exact product design adjustments that you're interested in, in, in making and, and let's look at it and let's have that conversation that, you know, the number of people who are actually going to go that deep is a much, much smaller number of people. It's so much easier to actually go back on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook and say, you know, be on the big tech platforms, be like, oh, you know, this free speech platform sucks, but you're, you're saying it on the other platform that's clearly way worse. So, mm -hmm. you know, but at the end of the day, I get it. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility to build an, an epic product and we're, we're working on it. Yeah, uh, here's a question that would uh, sort of lead into the other part of my thinking on, uh, on some of this stuff. So this is... Uh, Nikolaska says, uh, hey, David, ask him how much pressure he is ready to take until he adjusts to the modern narrative. So so here th this was kind of this was kind of my concern, because all of these all of these platforms, they all start off by saying, yes, everyone come here. Everyone is welcome. Everyone's here. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's here. And then they grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And then the more they grow, the more they decide, actually, now we have to start controlling what you say. But by that time, you're already hooked in the system. You've already spent years on the system. Uh, you know, all the most of the people you interact with in your day are, are through that system. And so it's very difficult to just say, well, I don't like what this system is doing now. So I'm getting I'm getting off it. So you're sort of you're sort of stuck to it. So so basically, here's my thinking as far as as far as me, me flipping out, it's kind of. uh I started off on all these platforms and then one by one, they start telling me, uh, 
nope, you can't say that thing that you could you you could say at any other time in our history, but we just decided now that even though there's nothing in our rules that says you can't say that, uh, a human reviewer is going to say whatever he wants about it, and we're going to start blocking you for that. And then so that the concern is, now we see Mines, and Mines is saying, "Hey, everyone, everyone, come o- come over here. We're not we're not doing that." But as you get bigger and bigger, the pressure is going to come down on you more and and more. And so I'm thinking, wait a minute. If, if they're already starting, so it's, it was mainly not, Hey, this is, this is a horrible system. It's just like YouTube. It's more like, it's more like they, if there's, if they're, if they've got this small issue now Mm -hmm. and the pressure is just going to keep growing, it kind of looks like they're going to head in the same direction as, as some of these other platforms. So, so the idea here is mines gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, what happens when there's all this massive pressure from the media and everyone else saying you're radicalizing people? We already have that pressure. Um, so here's what I'll say. I honestly, I probably would have done the same thing if I were you for how, for how you reacted. But here's the thing. Facebook never had a first amendment based policy ever. They, they were maybe more lenient and maybe the policy has gotten more strict and but twitter never had a first amendment based policy either they never said that they were more open and twitter did have a slogan like the free speech wing of the free speech party or something like that which is insane but they never actually said first amendment based so that's a really important distinction that you know, we are saying that, and obviously it would be suicide to abandon that. It also doesn't make sense from an overhead perspective of moderation. If you are enforcing terms that are like, oh, this word isn't okay in this context, this word isn't okay, you have to ha- hire 5,000 more moderators to, <laughs> to sift through all the reports, and you, suddenly your, your moderation job is, is 100x. So, and not to mention, we also, the media already, you know, the media that wants to target us has already targeted us. Um, they're, they're already coming after us for that. And we, we try to explain to them, actually, if you look at the research about censorship, censorship causes radicalization. I mean, look at what it did to you. You mm-hmm. bugged out. I'm not, not that that's a radical, not that you got radicalized, but I'm just saying, look at the emotional reaction you mm-hmm. had to getting censored. When that woman uh, went and shot up, uh, uh, shot some people at the YouTube headquarters, I don't know if you remember that, um, she was mad about getting censored. If you mm-hmm. look at a lot of the peer reviewed research around this, this topic, censorship can cause violence. There's there's dozens of studies. So what yep. we're what our, our response to the media who tells us you guys are causing radicalization, you're causing you know more more extremists or or Nazis or or whatever, it's actually not true if you look at the empirical evidence around the topic. Which is why we brought on Daryl Davis to our advisory board, who has successfully gotten you know hundreds of people to leave the KKK, and he did that by befriending them and, and mm-hmm. respecting their free speech and having conversations, and guess what? Over time, through discourse, society calms down. If you want to flare up society, you ban stuff. So what what we say to the media is you're actually taking the emotional reaction that causes more extremism and more polarization. Mm -hmm. No, you are absolutely correct. And by the way, that's that's probably the main factor in me getting ticked off when something gets banned is not that, uh, oh, I'm so angry that my content gets banned. It's that I I understand the the impact this this has on society. This goes way back to when, it was way back in the early 2000s and there were uh, uh, those Jylans, Postens, uh, or, and I think they, I think in that, I think in Danish it's Jylans, Posten or something like that. They post, they posted these, uh, these series of Muhammad cartoons and it had never crossed my mind that 
I'm going to start posting cartoons or something like that. But when people started killing over it, then it became, and, and none of the media would post the cartoons. No, no, no other journalists were willing to post the cartoons. Yale University even put out a book on the cartoons. They wouldn't include the cartoons in the book. Uh, and I'm just thinking, wait a minute, if someone says, it, it seems to me if someone says, hey, I'm going to kill over this, then I'm going to kill over this speech, then everyone needs to jump out and do that speech whoever it is, I don't care, atheist, Christian, Muslim, whoever, someone says, hey, I'm going to kill you if you say this or do this or draw this cartoon, then everyone needs to say, well, we're going to, then we're all going to do it until you decide that, that we're allowed to, we're allowed to say that. And so it, 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 it seemed to me that by everyone then not posting the cartoons, even if they're talking about them, they, they kind of reinforced, hey, if you, if you want to get your way, turn to violence and then every then we'll all back down. We'll all just back down immediately. And then eventually we got to, Anders Breivik, who goes on a who goes on a killing spree in Norway, and I I I downloaded his fifteen hundred page manifesto. Some of it is completely irrelevant stuff, like his daily schedules and, and recipes and stuff. But all of the sections that were on his thought processes, I read all those, and it was completely different from what I was hearing about him in the media. The media were saying that he's radicalized by listening to Robert Spencer, or Pamela Geller, and, and these things. And I looked at his manifesto. He started planning this. He started planning his attack before anyone had ever heard about any of these people. And I looked at his actual reasoning for turning to violence. And this was all the way back in the 90s, which is why he's so scary. It's scary when a guy decides to do something in the 90s and says, you know, if I need to take 10 or 15 years to plan this perfectly, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, much more dangerous than someone who just, you know, runs out and starts, starts shooting or something like that. But he says in his manifesto that he started... Uh, he started uh, becoming concerned about various problems, but he he said that in my country, if you try to raise any sort of question or criticism about certain positions, they'll just call you racist and they'll shut you down and you will not even allow allow you to voice your concern. And so he said he basically came to conclude that speech is useless. We've entered a post free speech civilization where all the avenues and channels for open discussion are blocked and banned and therefore the only way to get your message across is to go on a killing spree and you find something similar with that guy who did the mosque shooting down in new zealand that's someone who had given up on free speech because he believes that any any of his concerns that he raises so guys just, just try to understand even if you're even if you're even if you're a total scumbag right even if you're a total scumbag with scumbag ideas um if you, if, if you say, hey, I, I've got this thing and it's really, really bothering me and I want to talk about it and I want to talk about it and someone says you can't, you're not allowed to talk about it. Well, guess what? That didn't, that didn't take away those concerns. It's just told you that, well, talking about it is not going to, not going to be the way to go. Uh, whereas, as you pointed out, there are actually people who take the KKK and de-radicalizing them by getting them in a process of discussion. Now, just imagine that instead of that, he just uh, silence them every time they try to raise any concern they have. You're not de-radicalizing anyway. You'd make them more radical. You'd make them more. You'd make them more inclined to turn to violence. And so, yeah, this is a, this is it, 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 when we look at sort of this phenomena, and then we 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 see that the censorship is escalating on all of the main uh, platforms. It's like, do you guys know what you're doing? Do you do you know that you're creating an entire generation of violent radicals and not just people saying messed up stuff very very disturbing and 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 the offensive part about it is that their justification is that they are de-radicalizing by sense i mean that's usually the excuse for censorship mm -hmm. is that you know this idea is is going to cause violence mm -hmm. um and you know the idea is dangerous not the censorship but i mean you know, if we had the resources, we would be funding studies right now trying to correlate the the big tech censorship with, you know, with the violence. And, you know, th this th there have been major studies done. I mean, on there was a study of hundreds of millions of posts on Reddit, which concluded, you know, was it was ac asking if Reddit censorship, new censorship policies were working and you know, the media came out and said, you know, Vice did a piece. Study shows that Reddit censorship works. But actually, if you read the study, it says that the speech just went and got worse 
in other parts of the internet. So it didn't, can you hide ideas? Yeah, you go, it's happening. Mm -hmm. But can you get rid of those ideas? No. And the, the psychological damage that you're causing by pushing those ideas under the rug is, you know, just terrifying. So, you know, it was like when Vice wrote that article, they didn't want to read the study. They just wanted to, you know, make a, a political point about, you know, if you can censor. Yes, guess what? You can censor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can censorship appear to work? Yes, but does it? No. Um, along, along these lines, because you, you mentioned a, uh, a pro-freedom of uh, basically First Amendment type policy. So guys, uh, understand what, what, when we're talking about, you know, sort of broad approaches, um, a First Amendment type policy is more along the lines of uh, your, your, your speech is protected. And so uh, I guess the, is the idea here that a platform is kind of like a like a mini version of the United States and that the 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 people who run the platform are more along the lines of the government where they are not going to uh, interfere with free speech unless it, it crosses lines. Is that the idea behind a, a freedom of so speech model? The uh, the EFF Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is like a digital rights group, they back in the day drafted uh, a document called the Manila Principles. If you go to manilaprinciples.org, you can read them. And there was like hundreds of sites, digital intermediaries that signed on to this. We, we signed on to it. And it basically talks about digital intermediaries not taking down content unless there's a court order to take down the content. And like I mentioned, you know, spam and certain other um, sort of like malicious types of behavior, we're not gonna wait, you know, we're never gonna get a court order to take down like a malicious spammer. But generally speaking, that's what we like to stick to. And so that's what makes sense. What, what, why would we behave differently than, you know, a phone company or a bank? and why should we be injecting our own beliefs upon, you know, the communications that are, are flowing through the network? So that's just something that instinctually we, we agree with. And it makes sense in terms of the research. It makes sense in terms of the philosophy. And, you know, in terms, I, I think where we need to focus is honestly on this area of the blur the mm -hmm. NSFW blur not impacting content that it shouldn't impact because when when you have like the cartoons of of Muhammad, Muhammad or you know you'll see a lot of the um, cartoons that are like of the the Jewish guy you know with all the big sort of body body. Um, features, you know, yep. nose. Um, <laughs> and a lot of people will say, okay, that's, that's anti-Semitic. I don't know if you want that on your screen, you know, when you're at work, I do think that it should be up to you. We allow the option to turn off that, uh, that filter. But, you know, the reality is that there's, there's controversy in the middle yep. and that's where the mistakes are going to happen. All I can say is that on mines, the mistakes don't get you banned. Mm -hmm. They, you know, if, if a, in order to coexist with regular cat photos and all of the most hardcore speech that you can think of, you need to, you know, there's no like half blur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there's, a, there, there's a point where a content content gets thrown into a bucket and we have an appeals process and we want to keep making it better. And I think there should probably maybe be an option for a channel that repeatedly is mistakenly getting put into the bucket, maybe should get whitelisted or you, maybe you could have something like that to, to prevent, you know, repetitive mistakes on a certain channel or if a certain channel is getting targeted. But, you know, these are the types of nuances that need to get coded. They need to get built into the the report queues and um and into the tagging system on the channels and you know this is the kind of stuff that takes years to build and a, a lot of money and resources and 
we, we do want to make that happen. It just, it takes time and patience and we're trying to make, you know, like you mentioned rightly in the beginning, you know, what is going to prevent us from caving to all of the pressures that will come to us in terms of, um, you know, media or demonetization, whatnot. The reason we moved to a hybrid fiat currency and crypto system is because we knew we needed to integrate crypto because payment processors can just come at us and say, hey, you better take that down or else we're going to take away your revenue stream. So we knew we needed to provide, you know, not only ourselves, but but our channels and our, our creators with the option to get paid out in crypto because that enables us to tell Stripe, well, guess what? We pay, you know, in crypto to to NSFW channels and we and you can never take away that stream. So it's um, it's just not in our interest to go down that road. But I also, you know, don't want to go down the road of being like, oh, trust us. Like we're the free speech network. You better trust us. Like it's the 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 new Internet is trustless. You shouldn't have to trust us. And, and so we're, that that's why infrastructure that is powered by the people and not only powered by us is is the future so it shouldn't be an an issue of us even being able to take it down now i'm not going to say that we're in that position like that's that's a utopian goal of being uncensorable and we're trying to get there and we're trying to integrate peer-to-peer content systems so that we can facilitate that, mm-hmm. but it, it takes time. Mm-hmm. Um, we did have a, a <laughs> we do have a lot of uh, international viewers. And so uh, some people were asking, uh, so Sophia Agape said, who here isn't American? Do you understand the first amendment? And let, let me just go ahead and read it for anyone who, I, I assume that, that most people outside of the United States are still uh, familiar with the idea. But uh, uh, so this is, this is uh, for anyone who's outside of the United States, uh, we're a constitutional republic, so we have a, a constitution, and that, that constitution comes with a, a bill of rights. And these are these are rights, and the bill of rights is basically a list of things that the government cannot do to you. The, the, main, the main goal of the founding fathers was to avoid a tyranny, avoid any particular small group from being able to establish a tyranny over you, right? So that's why you have a system of checks and balances. That's why you have a bill of rights. They're trying to say, let, let's not end up with the same situation that, that people have had in the past. So the First Amendment just says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances so it's just simply saying that the government is not going to stop you from doing these kinds of things and so a free speech approach a first amendment approach um on a platform would be uh would be different from something like some of the some of the platforms that that you're you're most familiar with and that those those platforms might say here's a list of all the things you can't you can't do and you can't say on our platform and they can kind of make rules that they want the problem is they how they actually end up using those uh those policies because what what they do is they'll say we have a rule against this and then they'll apply it to basically any speech that they don't like. And so you end up with something that's just massively dysfunctional and it's getting worse by the day because uh, as, as the question, you can tell where people's concerns are at. What, what, what happens when the pressure comes down in you? They're saying that because they know Twitter will cave. Facebook will cave. YouTube will cave. Any of these, if you put either uh, public condemnation against them, they'll cave. And if you put financial pressure on them, they'll cave, right? So when the ad agencies say, hey, we don't like that you have this policy, they, they just back down. Um, now, a- along this issue, because uh, it's good that you're sort of zeroing in on where the difficult area lies. Uh, this is one of this is people ask why I don't uh, post more on BitChute. Well, BitChute does not do a good job of basically not seeing content that you don't want to see. Right. So I'll post a video on BitChute and then there's the little discussion right below it. And on YouTube, I actually don't have a problem with that. If someone comes on there and he's he's you know saying hey kill people or something like that, I could just I could just block him, and I don't ever I don't have to see that person again. On BitChute, I can block myself from 
seeing some, but it's, it's, it's worse because people can post pictures. They can't post pictures in the YouTube uh, comment section. In the BitChute comment section, they can post pictures. And so you could post a video on any topic and you'll end up with a massive number of anti-Semites, anti-Blacks, uh, uh, anti-Muslims in the sense that it, they're not criticizing the ideology. They're, they're calling for, you know, their deaths and so on. And, and you post it down there and you can block yourself from seeing them, but they're still down there underneath your video. You can see because people are responding to them and they will basically take any situation, any video on any topic, and they'll turn it into you know, the Jews or something like that. And a big right. argument about the Jews. And I'm just thinking, I don't want you to be forced to stop talking about anything that concerns you, but I don't, I don't want to see it. So, so in terms of free freedom of speech, I, I, I kind of view, you know, platforms as kind of, you know, mi like miniature internet versions of countries in the sense that you have the government and the government shouldn't be blocking speech. But if I don't want to hear you, guess what? I can go to my house and I don't have to hear you. I don't have to hear anything you say. And so it, it should kind of be like that. And so how do you navigate? Now, if I recall on- But on, isn't that interesting that you find yourself on sort of both sides yep. of the conversation there? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the reason for that happening has to do with permissions controls, blocking tools, you know, all of which is is pretty complicated software to build, I'm sure they're working on it. You know, we're working really hard on it, you know, ultimately providing the user and the creator control to see what they want to see, allow the types of comments or, you know, allow comments at all. All that stuff takes a really long time to build. And it's just, yeah, I appreciate you saying that because that is exactly the challenge. And so we put a lot of time into building these, these filtering mechanisms. But the problem is that, you know, someone who who posts something in your comment section that disagrees with it you know is suddenly gonna erupt on youtube about it and it's like but that you need those tags in order to provide the control to people to see what they want to see mm -hmm. yeah so so my, my kind of as far as the big issues yeah i think the 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 platforms um i mean a, a pro a pro first amendment type uh, platform should should not be banning content but the the people who use it need to have all the powers at their disposal to say hey you know i don't i don't want to see certain kinds of content i don't ever want to see it uh, i don't ever want to see something from this guy i don't like him and uh and so yeah it's a uh, how do you how do you get that? And guys, because this is kind of a big issue, right? This whole internet age is kind of a new period. We're finding we're, we're finding new ways of interacting with each other and getting along with each other without violating people's rights. And this stuff takes time. We're figuring it. We're we're figuring these things out right now. So so just just to give everyone an idea, um, you know, back in the '90s, there were these as platforms were emerging, the concern became, um, you know, what happens if people are posting all this you know, gore or something on there and you don't want your kids seeing it, what do you do? And so they came up with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to say that, uh, you know, the, the platforms won't be held responsible for content posted on there. But it also gave them the ability to to block certain content in good faith if there's, you know, gore and stuff like that and there's there's kids there and stuff like that. So that became the concern. But here we are, here we are more than two decades later and these platforms are relying on on those rules namely they're not responsible for the content and yet they can block content in good faith and it's just absolutely insane how they're using it so they'll say we have a policy here no hate speech but the trust and safety there's no one over the trust and safety team at youtube they could just say anything they don't like is hate speech and and just to give people a parallel and then uh and then um and then uh, we'll probably be wrapping up after that, so you can you can uh, you can respond to this and add anything else uh, that you like, Bill. But uh, th how how this is being used? If you understand how this is actually being used, suppose you had a restaurant and that you are like a a white supremacist and you didn't want any black people in your restaurant. Well, you can't just come out and say I don't want any black people in my restaurant. You can't say that; it's illegal. But what you could say is you could say, well, we have a, a no a no nudity policy. And then every time a black family shows up to your restaurant, you say, oh, sorry, you're not allowed in here. You're nude. And they say, what are you talking about? I'm not nude. And they say, yeah, we've decided that you're nude. So you have to get out of here. Now, notice you're doing exactly what you want to do. 
you're blocking you're blocking people that you don't want in your restaurant but you're not allowed to say why you're really blocking them so you come up with this alternative explanation for why you're blocking them and then you'll you just apply this ridiculous explanation to them and so you can you could do that with anyone you could block any kind of people you want by saying you're blocking them for for another reason that's what these platforms are all doing they're saying oh we're against hate speech you're against hate speech right yeah we're all against hate speech okay well anything that this trust and safety team member doesn't happen to agree with he can block and call it hate speech well now you're not blocking hate speech you're blocking you know you're blocking content for other reasons and it's massively messed up so you have this huge issue of how are we navigating this one of the biggest changes in human civilization that's ever occurred how do we navigate this? And you see where it's being, a, where people are using it to establish a tyranny, right? They're, they're establishing tech tyrannies over everyone. And my goodness, that is that is what uh, that is what we have to be against. Uh, so Bill, uh, uh, any thoughts on on any of that? And, and yeah, I mean, any? it's it's fascinating that they even had the phrase in good faith in section 230. I mean, it seems like a very hazy phrase to be in a legal document um but 230 provides immunity it also it's not just about gore it does give platforms the ability to have moderation policies i mean i fully agree that what all of the big tech sites have done in terms of being pretty loose on on moderation for you know their whole growth phase you know they got hundreds of millions of people by being pretty relaxed about everything and then you know now that they've reached critical mass they're locking down it's basically false advertising to a certain degree at the same time i don't think that any of them ever had first amendment based policies they might have been more loose with it um, but they they never said that and you know they were always spying on everybody Mm -hmm. They were always sort of abusing their users from the beginning. It, granted, they've Web2, Facebook, Google, Twitter, they've done great things for the world, but they're totally corrupt. They're not transparent. The, the moderation policies are out the window. The surveillance is insane. We don't know what's going on. And so the litmus test for me joining a new network is, is it open source? Can I see the algorithms? Can I understand what's actually happening? Um, is there shadow banning occurring? Granted, most people aren't gonna go and inspect the code, but if the code's open source, guess what? The hackers, the cybersecurity people, the developers, they're gonna do the work for you and they're gonna write articles about it and let everyone know that you know this is audited. If it's unauditable, it's totally unaccountable. So. That's a tough one because most people don't care. They're like open source. What is that? Why do I care? You, you, it's it's not that you're gonna go look at the code. It's a principle. It's the same with you know is are the communications encrypted? You know is there a commitment to the First Amendment? We're not perfect. Um, we're trying to build a better system, and it's gonna take time. It's gonna take patience. Mistakes are gonna get made, but you just have to look at the foundational principles of the network and is it doing its best to get there and is it communicating with the users to improve so anyway man i really i really appreciate you having me on i hope that you'll you know you'll hop back on minds post once in a while and uh yeah if anyone wants to reach out to me if you have any issues minds.com slash otman o-t-t-m-a-n feel free to directly you know message me let us know your ideas if you have specific recommendations for helping make the system better we're, we're listening and you know we we want to improve uh, let, let me let me hand that one over to the jury. <laughs> uh, guys, what do you what do you think? Uh, what do you think of uh, uh, Bill's uh, approach here and Minds? Should we uh, should we start uh, should we start posting on Minds again here? Uh, let me know what you think. And 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 uh, along the lines of you know what you just mentioned about the uh, the platforms, um, uh, I actually have no problem with them saying. We don't allow this kind of content or we, we don't allow racist content or something like that. It's it's the idea that they all state their policies and then and then they apply those policies to people who aren't violating the policies as an excuse to block them for other reasons. And uh, just uh, just absolutely insane. Um, all right, guys. So uh, we're going to we're going to go ahead and close out now. Uh, close out now. But guys, uh, what do you think? Should we because there is this big question, right? We're all, everyone's looking for the best alternative to the main platforms. And so what do you think about Minds versus 
uh, some of the other alternatives. Um, that looks like people are saying, let's see, we got the jury here. So Finding Truth says, yep, a uh, bunch of people said they went and signed up for mines. Uh, BJ says, yes. Uh, Slam RN says, thanks for coming on. Uh, Phyllis says, yes. Warrior Woman says, yes. Uh, Jean says, give it a shot. Sila says, yes. Magda says, yes. Uh, Co cover your bases. I mean, it's not, you know, supporting alternatives is the only way that alternatives are going to grow. I just recommend people really look into the alternatives and understand if they're really walking the walk. It's easy to say that you're pro-privacy and you're pro-free speech and you're pro-transparency, but if the code's not open source, if it's you know not encrypted, then it's it's not that much different. You're, they're, they're saying, trust us. They're not saying, hey, look at the algorithms. At the end of the day, you know, diversity, I think, in platforms is is a positive thing though. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it looks uh it looks like everyone's unanimous on uh using mines. So all, all right, right guys, we'll uh we'll we'll go ahead and uh try out try out mines as an alternative uh platform for for a year. Uh so continue with whatever platforms you're using, but uh, uh also use mines because keep in mind when ever you know if there's ever a meltdown when everyone gets fed up with YouTube and decides we're done with YouTube you need other platforms that are already right there and established and that you've been using and that you're familiar with. So the idea is whatever you're using, you know, you want to use some alternatives and, and be on those platforms and be on those, uh, be active on those platforms. All right. So everyone, uh, after we're done here, I will add the mines link to my channel. I haven't used it in, in over a year, but, uh, <laughs> my, my channel's still there because they don't take it down. So I'll go ahead and add that back and guys follow me on mines and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes and see how you like it. All right. Thanks to Bill Ottman for joining us and explaining the, the uh, issues here that are involved and for being far more transparent than any other companies that we're used to right now. Thanks for having me. Catch you all later.